Because I think people think of, again, I, I want to kind of talk about the veneer of progressive values that Canada is supposedly known for. Um, and so I, the fact is, is that Canada, just like the United States and other many other places are, are colonial states are, are built on sort of the, the remnants of colonialism, if you could say that. And, you know, a lot of the really obvious forms of violence that have been enacted against whole groups of people, indigenous people in particular in this case, uh, by these states, by these governments, um, it's sort of been obscured or it's been, I think, it's it's changed. And, and the rhetoric and language around this sort of violence has changed as well. And I think, I don't know how I could even frame this as a question for you, but I guess for people that are, you know, maybe don't experience this, they don't really understand what's currently happening to people that are in these sort of, sort of uh, situations and how you know, something that seems so distant and so far in the past is still manifesting in the present. It's just sort of manifesting in a new f- form or, or in a more um, sanitized form, you could say. Uh, you know, in what ways is that, at least in your mind, in the way that you've seen it, still present in the lives of, say, indigenous people in Canada? I think one thing I tell people about uh, colonial nation states like Canada and the U.S. and other countries is they're basically they're like apartheid states. And in Canada here we have uh, you know there's you know there's this whole the right wing and the, the conservatives not have this thing like you know one law for all no one's above the law and stuff like that. But in Canada we actually have separate laws that govern the lives of Indigenous people, and that's through the Indian Act, which was created in 1876. And the Indian Act has it's a whole set of laws and regulations for governing indigenous peoples and it had a lot of stuff in it like that's how the reservation system was uh institutionalized it mandated the the residential schools so children were forcibly taken it and put placed in these residential industrial schools uh there was regulations about who you could marry there was a pass system so you couldn't leave the reserve without getting uh authorization from the indian agent I mean, there's a whole slew that govern every aspect of indigenous lives. So it created an apartheid system here in Canada, and that still exists today, and that's partly why the lives of indigenous people, the social conditions that they live under, are you know, largely uh, most Canadian, non-indigenous Canadians are ignorant of these social conditions, they're ignorant of the the... The uh, the impoverishment that most Indigenous people have to live under, um, the reservations are physically separated from settler communities. You know, a lot of the reservations are in rural areas. Uh, you can go to a small town, any small town in Canada, and there could be a reservation like five minutes out of town. And you ask uh, a non-Indigenous person, if you're trying to find directions how to get to this reserve... You ask a non-indigenous person, and they have no no idea. You know, they, a lot of times we, this happened to us. We would roll up, and we're trying to find directions, and they don't even know there's a reservation there. So indigenous people kind of have this dual thing, like they're they're kind of invisible in a sense. Uh, their lives are n- not uh, comprehended. Uh, their the living conditions they live under aren't comprehended, unless it becomes like some national crisis. Like a few years ago, it was Attawapiskat, which is a uh, a native community in northern Ontario, which became a big focal point because of the level of poverty, the poor housing, and then once in a while we'll have like a there'll be like a small national thing about the water, the the, the contaminated water, the need for water. Uh, pe- native people, a lot of communities have to boil their water because their water is contaminated. All this type of stuff. Um, so in that, in that it, this is all part of this apartheid society where you have these really separate uh, lives that non-indigenous people live from non from from indigenous people. Um, so I mean, I mean that's that's a big part of it. Um, so when indigenous people rise up and they're trying to stop something like this, you know, a pipeline, you have a big reaction from non-indigenous people. Like a lot of racism starts coming out. And I think a lot of it has to do with the people are just ignorant. They're ignorant about the social conditions Native people have to live under. They're ignorant about the laws of Canada and how Canada came to be formed as a colonial nation state. I mean, there's a whole mythology. Every nation state has a mythology about how it was formed, and it's always a good story because you don't want to tell a story of, <laughs> of genocide. That's how 
your country that you're so proud of came to be, you know, you're not going to include that as part of your national mythology. So there's all this erasure of the genocide, the brutality, violence of colonialism. It's all minimized. And so a lot of people, you know, that's what they're taught in school, and that's actually what they want to believe. But the other thing I'd say about about Canada is you, you do have this perception. I mean, internationally, certainly Canada has this, there's a view of Canada as being very progressive, very modern, uh, a social democratic country almost, you know, healthcare. Uh, all these rights of Indigenous people are recognized and stuff like that. Uh, but part of the thing about that is I think in Canada, you know, you actually you do have uh, a significant amount of support for Indigenous peoples. So even right now you have these train blockades, you have the government and the corporations talking about this is paralyzing the Canadian economy, these protesters are holding the economy hostage and all this demonizing of the blo- of the blockades but you actually still have like almost 40% of the population is basically supporting the blockades you have 60 per- you know according to some recent polls 60% of people are opposed to the blockades you know, that leaves almost 40% are somewhat supportive or not extremely opposed to them but then in that same poll you have like it's seventy-five uh, percent of the people polled uh, believe there needs to be more uh, more reconciliation, more work done to help indigenous people. So you kind of have these these different dynamics at play. I think if something like this happened in the United States, you'd have a very different uh, response. And this is. This level of support, I think, it comes from the work that Indigenous and non-Indigenous solidarity activists have been doing for the last few decades in Canada. So there's been a lot of uh, public education and all these national debates about the missing and murdered woman and uh, the residential school stuff. And these things these big national debates, these big inquiries that have occurred, I mean, these all arose from grass, grassroots movements. So, I mean, those are just some of the different dynamics going on in Canada right now. I mean, even during OCA, where you, you had a police officer shot and killed, and you had very militant uh, actions occurring, and you had armed warriors confronting the police and soldiers, I mean, you still had widespread uh, support for the Mohawk position. Right. And this is despite all the stuff going on there. So, I mean, those are just some points I think that are important to consider when uh, talking about Canada and what's going on here.